Want to know what your dog is thinking? Have a challenging dog behavior you need help with? The Dish on Dogs is your source for all your canine questions. Improve your relationship with your dog and deepen your understanding of your furry friend right here on the Dish on Dogs. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dish on Dogs. I'm your host, Mike Gould, affectionately known as the Mayor of Houndstown, USA. I'm joined today by the very lovely Jackie Bondanza, president of Houndstown, USA. And uh, we, tonight we're going to talk about, or today we're going to talk about separation anxiety because we're kind of, I don't know where we are in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but dogs have been cooped up and humans have been cooped up a very, very long time. And now that people are actually not even going back to work, but the dogs that were rescued from the shelter are showing signs of anxiety from being around just at home all day. Right. Oh. Yeah, I agree. That's what, that's what, what the, the news we've been getting from a lot of our customers. So we figured we'd take the time to do a show on separation anxiety, what the causes are, kind of how to work through it at home, If either if you are going back to work and you're needing to leave your house, or if you're staying at home and you've now, that's a huge change yes. in your routine, right? Right. For both you and the dog. So right. we'll talk through a few tips on how to manage. Definitely. We'll go back, I'll do a little history of dogs and current where we are. First, as always though, I do want to talk a little bit about our the current status of our Houndstown franchise, where we are, five minutes. For those, I mean, we do have a lot of franchisees, future mm -hmm. franchisors, no, we're the franchisor, future franchisees. Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully, right, well, that's whatever, maybe it'll be a good thing. Anyway, uh, we're doing, you know, we're, as I said, New York at least, we're out of the COVID mm, illness and apex. death. Apex. Yeah. Apex, good word. So we're out of the apex. Uh, and business is really doing very well our yes. legacy stores here on long island are doing very well they're all coming back uh they're actually everyone's almost back up to 100 percent pre-covid numbers you right. know boarding's down a bit because of travel restrictions right. but it's been pretty surprising to me to see um we're back up to having waiting lists in a lot of our legacy stores for not not for boarding but okay. for evaluations evaluation i predict this is my prediction okay let's write daycare this numbers our daycare customer base is going to in some of these stores exceed pre-covid numbers for two reasons number one so many people adopted a dog during quarantine which is wonderful the shelters around here were basically cleared these dogs all now three months later need to get into a daycare routine um, and secondly, with more people working from home than ever, I think they realize more than ever that they can't be home with their dog 24-7. The dog needs to get out and get right. exercise. So that's why we're full of evaluations through Labor Day here mm -hmm. at our corporate store. Right. Well, and, yeah. you know, our other Long Island, a lot of our other Long well, Island and all of the other stores right. are, are seeing record numbers of new dogs coming in. Let's go on the other end of the spectrum. So those are our legacy stores, and if there's a sometimes a, a belief that because we're here on Long Island, we're doing so well, and, and the rest of the country isn't catching up. But I would have to point out two locations that I'm so blown away by, uh, and that would be our new Sanford location, Florida, Sanford, yeah. Florida, Orlando, for those of you listening, go to Sanford, leave your dog, free day of daycare. And Smyrna, Tennessee, Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they are, they've set records, which is ironic to me. So yeah, yeah. they have set, they opened a month or two ago. Uh, they opened June 20th and then June 27th. So at the height of the pandemic right. and these two stores hosted more evaluations in their opening week than any other store in Houndstown history, including those that have tw had 20 years of brand recognition exactly. uh, on Long Island. So it just goes to show you that number one, our marketing team is beyond oh. fantastic. Uh, what we're doing is working. Right. That's clear. And number two, there's a real need for our services, even during a pandemic. So just underscores the fact that pet care is a necessity for people. It's not a commodity. Right. And right. we're seeing that now more than ever. And we're an essential service. Yes. So, so again, we are data-driven. You don't have to speculate. So a lot of times our human brain goes to certain things and it's usually misinformation. Right. Here's the simple point for us, and then we're gonna talk about dogs, I promise. Those, we, we watch data, 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 and we see a direct correlation. It's, it's as plain as writing on a wall. Those franchisees 
that follow our system. And we have a very robust system to the point I could actually argue people would be like, we, we tell people when to turn on their lights, when to lock their doors, what temperature to set. So we don't miss anything. Maybe you could argue that it's a lot of information, but it's there for your use as a toolkit. We have financial people, we have business coaches. It, right. it, it's, it's unbelievable what we have. And for those people who uh, take advantage of those tools, take the tools out of their toolbox, they build a fantastic small business. Right, and so, I'll tell you, the franchisees that we have, for the vast most part, everybody follows the system. They're really involved, they really contribute. For those couple stragglers who you know don't, or they deviate, or they focus on the wrong things, it's not ironic that those are the stores that are the underperformers. Well, right. They so. go rogue, and you know that's fine. You know, you, you know, as a human, and we'll talk about the human brain. Is you you question things, you question data. I do. I don't blindly follow a path. Right, of course. But I, I, but after a certain period of time, the data speaks for itself. You, it's inarguable. You can put a lot of emotion and disagree, and I don't believe this. I don't believe that. I don't like whatever it is. We don't have to worry about it. We have data. Okay, I don't want to go on and on. Yeah, let's talk about, let's shift and talk about yeah. one of the reasons why our stores are doing so well. Um, and that is because pets need to interact in a natural pack environment to be psychologically well balanced, like you say, and, and to live right. a healthy, right. balanced life. So. So we have a lot of customers who ask us about separation anxiety. Now that they're home and working from home, they see that the dog is maybe more attached to them. Uh, and now we get a lot of questions. Well, now I have to go back to work or I have to leave the house. And my dog is so used to having me home for three, four, five months. How, do you, how does somebody go about? I think it's important to, 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 to go back in history, I think a little bit, and, and understand what relationship we have with dogs. Mm -hmm. So. We obviously know science has determined that we dogs evolved from wolves. That's, an, that's a fact of life. Yes. And we humans, several that hundred thousand or several thousand years ago, decided to domesticate dogs. So dogs were a likely animal for domestication because they are highly social. They're social pack animals. So unlike other animals, they were perfect for human use uh, for our sometimes selfish, but for the most importantly, utilitarian reasons. If we needed right. something to pull a wagon, if we needed something, uh, an animal to assist us in hunting, all these really the utilitarian. Protection, you know. Protection, are, right, their guarding abilities, absolutely. So, so what animal, in the, what, what wild animal would be best for that? Not elephants, not lions, not tigers, but dogs, because of their very so tight social order and their need for other uh, of their pack membership right. and their status in the pack. So, so we know that. So when dogs, wild dogs are born, they have a very social niche and how they establish themselves in the pack is by very simple. It's, it's, it's simple. They have to be ahead of the, the, their other pack members. So there's leaders of the pack and then there's subordinate members of the pack. So when we just think of that, then think about what we've done when we, we human beings, We've removed singular dogs, singular dogs away from their litter, their natural litter. And we mutated the wild dog. We mutated it for, right now, I think extremely selfish reasons. I mean, I could argue 100 years ago that hunting and, and work, utilitarian working dogs were necessity to move our society forward. Right. Now, flash forward to where we are in 2020, now we take dogs for very selfish reasons in my opinion, very selfish mm -hmm. reasons. Obviously dogs are wonderful because of that fact that they're social. So we want them, we want to touch them, we want to pet them. And that of course is a wonderful bonding experience for both dog and human. What has happened now, we've mutated the dog actually to the point now, I'm not even sure it should be another uh, animal. These tiny three or four or five pound dogs have been right. mutated from a wolf to a wild dog to now to be, I don't, it's a, so the, their mental capacity to develop is, it's really difficult. It's stunted. It's, it's stunted. Over, over breeding. Over breeding and mutations. Thus the word mutt. We've taken it and we mutated, mutated, mutated. Um, so with that said, now we're all 
you know, and the similarities, I mean, are so obvious, right? So now we are all denning. We're denning. We're forced to den. Back to the, our, 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 our nature. This right. is how we were as humans thousands of years ago. Dogs evolved from wolves. We evolved from primates. And we become, we've joined forces together. So now, because of this pandemic, we are forced to den into our little pack, our little social world of humans. Now we have this independent creature that doesn't think like us, doesn't act like us. They can't comprehend, they don't have anything really in common other than this social aspect and the need to be with other living creatures. So, so now we have the kids, the grand, everything is, people are getting on there, you know, there's no place to go, no outlet right. for their anxiety. So now we have this situation where people, as you correctly said, the shelters are empty. So people went out, I'm not sure if it was so altruistic as it was just the need to have something that was easy and cheap, like my first wife. No, oh, whoa, um, oh, no, 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 no. Oh. So, well, come on, we gotta break this levity. We need some <laughs> levity. Uh, so, so what was an easy fix? Go to the shelter, $200, I could bring a dog home, pet it, love it, it'll be there for me. We'll watch Dancing with the Stars together. Right. It was something for, I think, families to do with their children or to do together, which is nice. But mm. but we see the other side to it a lot oh. of times, right? So we see after the initial excitement's worn off and it's two or three months later, the dog's mm. exhibiting separation anxiety, mm. aggression, jumping, and the owners are at a loss of what to do because the excitement's worn off, the kids aren't interested anymore, and now you've made this 10-year commitment to this living creature and it is a commitment and it is your obligation as an owner to take care of your dog's needs. Like you said, we always take care of a dog's physical needs. We take them to the vet, we buy them the best beds, but we, it's a, there's a big knowledge gap about how to take care of a dog's psychological needs. Yes, thus we have our dog brain. So yes, the green brain is what you adopted. That's what's living in your dog's head. This is all of this crazy stuff that's in our head. So we've taken all this and trying to make this little animal brain into this big neocortex, which isn't gonna happen. Right. So, so like Jackie said, I, she's more optimistic. I, I see it as very selfish people taking dogs. Because if, if they were so altruistic, they wouldn't have been, shelters wouldn't have been packed with dogs right. all Speaking along. Right. right, so now it went from, okay, COVID-19, we're stuck at home, let's run through it. One place, we, one thing we can do is take a dog into our home. Yeah. And as Jackie said, this is a 10 year commitment, financial, emotional. So. Getting back to the separation anxiety, the focus of this episode, just think you're going to have the same problem with your two or three or four year old children. So it's, it's no different. This isn't really, this shouldn't be a head scratcher for people. So now you've, we have a whole society, frankly, of children uh, who now for the past six months, right. Have, don't have the normal social interactions right. as, as they would have. Way too, some of them are way too attached to their parents. Way too attached. Yeah, and it and, creates a codependency oh. that I think is very common in dogs. So people create this codependency right. on their dog. The dog then creates needs you back, and then but when you need to change that routine or that dynamic, the dog doesn't understand why, right? Absolutely. Well, one thing, another important fact that people forget or omit or don't realize dogs are maturing seven times faster than your child so what's three months in your child's life is two or three years in your dog's life roughly right obviously right. there's no denying that dogs are maturing very quickly that's why they have a shorter life uh, expectancy mm -hmm. that's why they uh, grow and start walking much quicker than human children mm -hmm. uh, humans uh, so, so that's the other thing. So we're out of sync in that regard. So this last six months to us was literally a lifetime for the dog. Where a child, you'll have a little bit of better chance when you start social dis uh, or when you start to socialize socialize yeah. your child. It's going to have to be done in small doses. Obviously, you can't get up for work uh, when when this ban lifts or whatever the future holds for us. You can't just get up and leave and say, tell your kids you'll be back or here's the new babysitter. Right, I, so I think that goes for dogs too. Is uh, And one of our, our franchisees, uh, Ashley Alkire, was actually on a, a national TV last Raleigh. week talking mm -hmm. about separation anxiety and giving some very helpful tips on what you can do in your home to begin the process of 
if you have to leave your house to go to work, um, and you can start now. So like Mike just mentioned, I think not expecting that this is just going to overnight, the dog is just going to understand that you need to go back to work. It is a process that you should start working on now, and there are certain tools that you can and should be using. Absolutely. Number one is is a, is a crate, right? We always talk about well, some form of, you have to start separation, separating emotionally and physically at some point in small doses. That doesn't mean you lock the dog in a crate and leave and go shopping for eight hours. We do this in very small doses and maximize the separation period. But, but let's be very frank. We experience separation. Humans have been creating this uh, separation anxiety way before yes. this. I mean, that's what Houndstown does. We address, so we address, and it's not a sales pitch. This is a fact of life. We provide the pack of dogs, right? The pack of dogs for your dog, your domesticated dog that you've isolated from other dogs. And again, it would be analogous to isolating your children and never let them play. Right, never let them play. Never, <laughs> right. right. never let them scrape their knee, never let them experience life. Right. So obviously we're, we're huge proponents of uh, having your dog in a regular daycare routine to address separation anxiety. It is hugely beneficial because what happens is the dog gains confidence when he comes to a facility and he interacts with other dogs. The dogs teach that dog how to interact, manners, dominance, pack uh hierarchy all of the things that dogs need to learn not from us but from other members of a pack then when the dog goes home at five or six o'clock at night he's way more well balanced the next day he may still be tired and you may it may be way easier for you to leave to go to work for five six seven hours if he if he was allowed to run around and interact in this pack environment for the day before so this is very common for some of our customers that have dogs with separation anxiety they'll either bring them you know, five days a week, or they'll bring them Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, what they notice is the dog is much calmer. Right. Yeah. Right. So, right. So, and this isn't an infomercial, this is a fact of life. How do we know this? As I said earlier, we're data-driven. We've taken care of two million visitors since our inception. So this isn't something we just scratching our head or read in a book. Right. This is factual we information. See it. You know, right, we I, see I, it. I see dogs coming in. I know we, I've, over the seven years I've been doing this, I know the customers who come in in tears mm -hmm. and are, their dogs are suffering from this and they don't know what to right. do. And we see the transformation that can be made by allowing the dog to have an interactive experience on a regular right. basis. It's just right. huge. And as Jackie said, this is situational. Not every, so when we talk about this, I'm not saying every dog from six months old to 10 years old needs this. The dog tells you what it needs. So right. your dog is always telling you. But at the end of the day, and I hate to say this because I don't mean it, my, our customers and our humans out there are very loving, caring people, and that's part of the problem. You've taken a dog, a predator, an animal, and to live into your house. So this, we don't have this problem with horses, uh, other animals, pigs, other lambs, right? We, well, pig people will start to bring pigs. Right, but they too. realize that pigs are not pack animals. Then they don't. They right. they're very smart and intelligent, but they don't have the same social structure as dogs. So right. dogs just fit into our life as humans because we share so many similarities. So they fit in. As so as I said, thousands of years ago, it was a natural fit to have a, right. a dog around your campfire and give them some uh, ribs or bones and you could sleep at night and the dog would alert right. you. But what we've done is made them codependent oh, and God. dependent on us. And that has to be balanced right. out. Right. And the, the simple answer again, when the dogs come to Houndstown, if they don't express or display the same behaviors at home, so then just ask yourself, is it right. the dog? Or, or your environment, me? or me. <laughs> yeah. That's that's simple. And as Jackie said, people come and cry. They don't even believe it's their dogs. Whether it's leash aggression, whether it's social, uh, what are we talking Separation. about here? Separation anxiety. <laughs> it's all at the hands of very loving, caring humans. Yeah. So they, yeah, and it's just what it is is a misunderstanding, not understanding the human brain versus the dog brain. I know nobody wants me to talk about that because they're well, sick of it. it's true, but that's what, that's what the heart of it so, is all about, right. really. So let's be, do things simple. And you don't have to be big things. This is the beauty of dogs. You don't have right. to go out and get 
separation anxiety medication, which I find ludicrous, right? Well, one of the things we do here, I do, when I have dogs in my behavioral class, I take them off of any psych medicine because I've never seen it to be, you know, vets or whoever might disagree with fine. I've never seen any real results. So right. I think my point is, it's, we talk about don't look, talk, or touch, just removing yourself emotionally right. and physically from your child. So when I say, or your dog, when I say physically, all I mean is don't stare at it and touch it constantly. Right. You can still watch Dancing with the Stars, but don't be analyzing your dog's behavior, talking to it, inviting it up on the couch, getting it food. Right. You don't like that creates like a very frenetic reaction oh. from the dog. And then when you're not there, giving the dog constant attention, and that is when the separation anxiety yes. starts to happen. So if you start to create the separation in your home while you're there with your dog, what you're going to notice is this. Three or four minutes later, after you practice this don't look, talk, or touch, your dog is just going to go and lay down. Of course. Hopefully in another room or away, away from you, you continue on whatever you're doing just for a half an hour, 45 minutes, ignoring the dog. This is going to teach the dog that it's okay to be separated from you for periods of time. And then you're going to slowly start to introduce that when you leave the home. Of course. Um, and, you know, we're, we're big proponents of using... Crates, uh, dens, like you say, dogs are dying yeah. animals. They need right. a safe place to right. feel. Now, some dogs don't do well in dens. And if you haven't utilized <sighs> it, you can't start using it now overnight. You've got It's a slow process. So right. we feed our dogs in our crates. That helps connect the dots for the dog. That this is my place. This is essentially, it's an equivalent to a bedroom for a dog, right? right? Well, you have more patience than I do. Very frankly, I've given up on the notion of recommending, because when I say crate, human hear cages. When human hear cages, they think of a prison where things are locked in. So I, I've given up yeah. on that. So, yeah. Well, but, I've just seen it work for my own. Right, I had I two dogs with the worst separation anxiety you could probably ever think of. They've gotten out of crates. They've jumped out of windows. Right. So for some dogs, it's for their own right. safety that they need to be in a crate. Right. But um, dogs raised properly. These were rescue dogs right. that never. So so the the premise is simple. So I don't even like to use the word crate. And don't you don't have all you keep it simpler than even that. If you have a five, six, seven year old child at home right now, or when you listen to this, at a certain time of night they go to bed. That's it. I don't think that you'd be talking to them, tickling them, checking on them, uh, psychoanalyzing them as they sleep. Maybe you would an infant, maybe. I know now they have monitors. My daughter's watching monitor. I feel like I'm in Alcatraz. The kid goes in his cr <laughs> crib and his monitor's watching if he's breathing correctly. So not only have we done this with dogs, we're now doing it to human children. We're yeah, and I think what, you know, not to go off on a tangent, but I think oh, what, okay. like, these days, like so many children are they have so much anxiety and it's because of this constant, maybe in part, this is just my opinion, of this constant hovering and interaction and codependency. And, the, and it's, it's, you've got to create confidence, just like you would create confidence in a child by, by separating from them at, at a certain point in the day, letting them go to school and learn from other kids and teachers. Right. That is what has to happen with your dog. Of course. And you have to have patience if you've been in your home for five months and your dog has been part of your pack, you have to have patience. It might take a couple right. weeks to start teaching the dog, you know, to... Oh, you to have to be a new, new person. A new, yeah, you, but you, not only the routine, you have to be different. Right. So we talk about leadership, structure, and consistency. That's what we need as humans, leadership, structure, and consistency. So, and that's what your, your dogs need and frankly, your children need. When you digress or go a different path, it rec creates conflict. So if, if you're always talking to your dog, just experiment, do this simple experiment. Pretend your dog is invisible. From the moment you hear me, this broadcast, don't look at your dog, don't touch or talk to the dog. Just, and it's gonna be, it, here's what I tell all my clients. This is so easy that most people can't yeah, do. Yeah, it. it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard to yeah, do. It's hard to do, but but I, I just know, because I've, I've done it myself, what what you'll see is this the dog become more, um, he'll become more well-balanced. And then when he becomes more well-balanced and he goes to lay down after an hour or so, you can then re-engage with him. But the re-engagement oh. has to be on your terms, right? Not the dog's The dog terms. can't trigger your behavior. It has right. to adapt to your behavior. 
So again, it's so simple that most people can't do it because of this toxic relationship we've developed. Um, but, but just give it a try and you'll see you're not hurting your dog, you're actually helping your dog. For because sure. a pack animal needs leadership more than love. I know that might sound yes. awkward, mm -hmm. but it needs leadership to survive. It, it survived to get to this point in our uh, evolution by leadership, consistency, and structure. If a puppy deviates from the leadership of its mother in the wild, it gets eaten by another predator. So it's very important that you're the leader of the dog. Leadership doesn't involve uh, yelling, screaming. We don't talk to dogs, right? I don't talk to animals, dogs, because they don't process human language. We talk about that endlessly. But I, I think it's a good exercise to just relax. The dog will be fine. The dog is always telling you things. And most importantly, or also as important, the dog is triggered by your movement. Yes. It's triggered by your movement and sounds. So for example, if you get up to go to the bathroom at three o'clock in the morning, like I do many, many times, uh, the dog won't move. It won't get off the bed because it knows, it, it doesn't tell time, it doesn't look at his Apple watch and say, oh, it's three o'clock, Jackie, or I might go into the uh, bathroom. But it knows that in the morning, when you get up, your behavior, all of your signals, all your cues, your social cues, you're getting up, you might right. make coffee, and then the dog gets aroused by that behavior. Because the cue, like, so dogs put together a sequence of cues, right, yes. into a picture. So yes. they know that you getting up at three in the morning when it's still dark out, that doesn't signal them because that's just one right. cue. Whereas they, they're thinking, but, okay, the cue that he's going to leave is the coffee machine going on. And yes. then he's getting picked up. So as much as you can break that routine yes. as well, that has worked for dogs that right. I've had with separation right. anxiety. I would, when I lived in an apartment in the city, I would, you know, shower, get dressed, blow dry my hair. That was a big trigger for my dog. Pick up the keys, and then I would take them for a walk. So it yeah. kind of like it's a self set them off yeah exactly. Life. But you said it right. It's subtle cues that add up. It's a puzzle. It's a and then they see a picture. I'll give you a quick one, and then we'll move on to greener pastures. In the police department, obviously we've all seen police dogs in the back of the police car and they're usually sleeping unless somebody goes knocks on the window. Or, but it, so when I used to go on, on calls, uh, police calls, if I was requested the canine team, many times I'd turn on my lights and siren. So that little simple act and just cueing the microphone. So not right. just cueing my microphone because I'd be talking all day back and forth cueing the microphone, right. requesting to go on meal or something, you know, <laughs> requesting some Dunkin' Donuts delivery, donuts. Meat, meat for coffee, you know, us uh, cops. Stereotypical. Stereotypical meat in the back Oops. of the, don't do right. Anyway, so just key keying the microphone didn't create that. Right, but together. But together yeah. with the siren, because what happened when we got to where we were going, he was, the dog was going to be deployed to do, like, right. live a doggy uh, dream, dream a yeah. doggy dream, yeah. hunt for something, either hunt for someone or something, drugs, bombs, whatever they're hunting for. Yeah. And so the initial, so I would get, I, and I would, and it was a challenge for me because the dog would be going wild. I could barely talk on the microphone then and get instructions because the dog now, his he arousal did. level was elevated. And it wasn't by, I didn't look back and say, we're going on a burglary call, you know, get ready. Right. It was none of that. It was cued by simple sounds and movements. Obviously, I'm right. driving faster. So, I mean, if that doesn't, and these are just dogs. So police dogs are just dogs. They come from the shelters. They're just dogs. They're not any highly more intelligent than other dogs. Okay, we got to wrap things up. Okay. So I would say the top three tips. Number one, start now. If you are, you know, having to change your routine, start by just small time frames of separation. Uh, whether that looks like using a crate, not using a crate, putting a dog in a bedroom. Um, and just then the second thing is don't look, talk, and touch. And do this in combination with the small uh, moments of separation, right? Yes. Um, and then the third thing is try changing your routine a bit to break that, to break that right. cue cycle for the dog and to just break yeah. things up. I think that that but, certainly helped me when I was That's very good this. advice. Change. If you go left, go right. If you go to the bathroom, soon, what you are, we are creatures of rituals, right? right. We all sit 
in the same chair at dinner. We put our keys and pocketbooks in the same place. We're, we're such right. creatures of habits and all dogs do. That's all they're thinking about. They're not thinking about when the COVID's gonna end. They're not thinking about going to Disney World. They're watching you. So my easiest, quickest advice, make the dog invisible. Pretend the dog is a ghost in your house. That means don't make any eye contact. Don't touch him just because he's near you. Don't ask him what's wrong if he's whining because this is what you've created. Humans created this. We have 50 dogs right here in our doggy daycare right now and you can hear a peep. All right, can we wrap this up? All right, we're going to wrap up. Uh, check us out on the Dish on Dogs podcast on Spotify, iTunes, and of course, join us every Monday at 8 on our Facebook uh, page, Dish on Dogs. We will see everybody next week. Nice, Jackie.